Laura's most recent film, Citizen Four, is currently playing in movie theatres, having been released in November, and last week was nominated for the Academy Award for Best Documentary. Yes. <laughs> Uh, in putting together this exhibition, we felt there was an urgent case for simultaneously presenting her two previous films, My Country, My Country and The Oath, along with some of the short films that she's produced for publication through The New York Times and The Guardian. The trilogy of feature-length documentaries and the accompanying shorts collectively form a highly revealing analysis of the expansion of the security state in the wake of 9-11 as well as shedding light on the lives of particular individuals as directly subject to US military and, and surveillance actions overseas and at home. So the final part of the trilogy, Citizen Four, serves as both a compelling narrative of Edward Snowden's actions as a whistleblower and a primary document of the journalistic work done principally by Laura and Glenn Greenwald that has enabled Snowden's revelations to reach a wide readership. This dynamic between filmmaking and journalism plays an important role in Laura's research and work. And last year, she founded with Greenwald and investigative journalist Jeremy Scahill the online news outlet The Intercept, focusing on the support of independent investigative journalism. Uh, we're really pleased that Laura could join us tonight uh, to discuss the 9-11 trilogy and her work more broadly with writer and, and editor Bettina Funk. Uh, Laura and Bettina have known each other um, since early last year, when Lit Laura contributed to a seminar Bettina leads with Jay Sanders at SVA, and I'm sure tonight's conversation will carry forward some of their existing discussions around documentary practices and critical art production in the light of the severe undermining of civil liberties experienced globally since 2001. So just to give some a formal biography to, to both Laura and Bettina, Laura's films have, have won and been nominated for numerous awards, including a previous Academy Award nomination for My Country, My Country, and two Emmy nominations for The Oath. Along with Glenn Greenwald, Ewan McCaskill, and Barton Gelman, her reporting around Edward Snowden's NSA revelations received a Pulitzer Prize for public service in 2014. Her work was exhibited at 2012 Whitney Biennial, and she will have a solo exhibition at the Whitney in spring 2016. In 2012, she was a recipient of a MacArthur Fellowship and has taught filmmaking at Duke and Yale universities. Uh, Bettina Funk is a writer and editor based in New York City, where she teaches in the master's program in critical theory and the arts at the School of Visual Arts. From 2009 to 2012, Funk was head of publications for Documenta 13, and previously from 2006 to 2010, she was US editor of Parquet magazine. She's the author of the book Pop and Populist Art Between High and Low, and the co-founder of the Leopard Press and the Continuous Project Group. So before I hand over to Laura and Bettina, I also wanted to um, especially thank Brenda Coughlin for her assistance with this exhibition and Zeitgeist Films for allowing us to exhibit My Country, My Country and The Oath. And this exhibition also wouldn't have been possible without the generosity and support of the Laura Poitras Exhibition Supporters Circle, made up of Thomas Dozel, Robert Gober and Donald Moffat, Stephen Schindler and Susan Kath, Michael Stipe, and Thea Westreich Wagner and Ethan Wagner, and also for the Friends of Artist Space for the continuing support of all the programs that we do here. So I'll hand over now to Bettina and Laura. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. <clears throat> it's very exciting for me to be here tonight with Laura and talk about her work and to see the great interest um, it has had, not only in the broader news, but also tonight, especially here. Um, and what's exciting about this is that in the broader news, I feel like we often quickly are brought to Edward Snowden as the person or the NSA. And here we have an audience where we can assume some of the work has been seen, some of the texts about the work have been read, and so we can have a more specific um, discussion and step back, maybe look at the trilogy, the 9-11 trilogy um, as a whole and see how it came about and evolved um, <clears throat> and also what its relation to to art might be and your relation, Laura, to art. Um, yeah, before we, I just want to say, I want to thank Artist Space for, for um, putting on this exhibition. 
Um, it's the first time actually that the trilogy has been sort of put into a context um, we, and that's really incredibly meaningful for me because this is a body of work that I've been doing for a long time and haven't put it into context so I'm really grateful for Artist Space for, for making that happen. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's what I found so inspiring too, to see it all together one more time and also the short films, but especially the three pieces. Um, and I wanted to start maybe at the beginning. I know you studied at the San Francisco Art Institute with Ernie Gare, and we're reading some uh, Frankfurt School, Benjamin and Adorno on aesthetics. Um, and maybe I thought you could tell us a little bit about how it influenced you and how you came from studying with a structuralist filmmaker to finding your long form documentary <laughs> narrative yeah. more in a verite or in direct, okay. cin uh, direct cinema. Uh, tradition. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't a um, obvious path for me to be doing this kind of documentary, um, uh, filming things happening. I mean, I started studying filmmaking at uh, in, in art school um, with sort of much more abstract type of filmmakers, um, and where the sort of the practice was not working with a big crew, but it was learning how to use a camera and doing your own editing. And then I, I was much more, and at that time, doing more essay type films and. I kind of was drawn to cinema because I was interested in, you know, finding ways to communicate that weren't about using words, but how you can communicate experience through images. And that's just always what I've been um, drawn to. And, uh, and so I started doing that kind of work um, and thinking that I'm sort of like a, you know, I'm a bit of a solo person. I mean, I'm sort of, my work is, um, I, I, the creative product part of it is often working alone. And so I never really thought that, you know, Filmmaking per se, like filmmaking the type that you show in cinemas with a lot of people would be really the right kind of a practice for me at that time. And this was um, in the late 80s, early 90s, and I was shooting like a 16 millimeter. And it was kind of when you had, there was a video, there was high 8 video, which was generally pretty ugly. So it wasn't like if you wanted to make images that were beautiful, high 8 video wasn't going to get you there. I mean, some people could do it. I mean, some people did some fantastic things, but it wasn't really a, a medium that I fell in love with. But I was shooting on, on 16 millimeter film. And, uh, and, you know, was finding, working more with images and, uh, and, and it's sort of like with the sort of shift in technology is when it became more possible to, to do more with, with video in terms of visuals. But w while I was um, studying, I also became very interested in, in social theory, political theory and critical theory and particularly the, the body of work from the Frankfurt School and people like Benjamin and Adorno. And, um, what I was really interested in, in their work or the ideas that they had about sort of doing social science um, as philosophers was the relationship between the empirical world, which is something that's not, that's, that you have to take um, uh, not as something that's of, of your imagination, but it's real, and, but that the kind of um, using social science as an interpretive, it, like the, the dialectical relationship between social science uh, or the, the person who's interpreting what the, the world is and the empirical world. And I was interested in how they articulated this idea of a dialectical relationship. And, and I was interested in it, it, you know, in terms of theory, but I didn't quite then translate it immediately into documentary filmmaking. I mean, that actually happened in a more organic setting when I began working on a project and that was a documentary project where we were following, I was um, working with a collaborator, Linda Bryant, and we were making a film about a changing neighborhood, about gentrification. And I started doing the camera work, and that was what was actually transformed me into the type of work that I do, which was being in the experience of holding a camera in the moment when things are actually happening. And that what, you, what I felt in those moments and how I responded to them and tried to articulate what was happening, and then also the, the basic fundamental human drama that that was revealed, not just always in high conflict situations, but in, you know, what could be, you know, somebody making tea in the morning, you know, that there was something about, just really beautiful to me about being in that relationship, having a camera and filming with people. And then that kind of became the trajectory of the, the type of filmmaking I do, which is long form um, documentary. So then um, the film that was screened just now, uh, Osei, can you see, uh, it's a little unusual, actually, formally and otherwise, it, in respect to what you were just describing, and you made this just after 9-11. Could you speak about it? Was it sort of a precursor to the trilogy in some way, or more of a... 
I, yeah, in retrospect, it was. In the, in the moment, it wasn't. It was, it was my response to what had happened at, at Ground Zero and 9-11. So in retrospect, I consider it to be sort of the first piece that I made in response to 9-11, in response to the US policy um, actions that have happened. So this is a, what we saw when you were coming in was, was images that I filmed um, in September and October 2001 at Ground Zero. And, and I filmed those, I just, I, it took me, um, I, I, you know, I was living in New York when, it, when the attacks happened and I had gone down there without a camera and di didn't film and it didn't feel right to film. Uh, and then I went again and started just focusing on the faces and, and somehow by looking at um, the, f the faces, I felt I could see a bit more of the you know, what couldn't be seen or what couldn't be expressed, you know, that they're really actually what was, you know, there, there, there was nothing. I mean, what people were, what I saw people were doing was sort of searching for what kind of meaning there, there was or how to understand the, the events. And in retrospect, looking back on it, um, you know, there's such a, I, th I think, compassion in these images, mm -hmm. and which is something I think that maybe we've lost a bit, you know, in terms of our response to, to these, um, to the events and um, and so in 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 retrospect it sort of it has it sort of has cast um, a kind of meaning in, in to, to how I see what's happening now. Well, it's interesting you say the compassion seems to have been lost because for me <clears throat> compassion is sort of the the point of view f from you know from where you make your work and so I when I watch the films I see compassion everywhere and this is maybe also what is so dramatic and beautiful about the, the work, how quiet it is and how the compassion uh, goes everywhere and you can find any kind of person in any sort of context or culture or religion. Um, so that was definitely an, an outstanding aspect of your work for me and <clears throat> maybe it, it's striking a chord like it seems so right now because compassion seems to be disappearing too much. Um, I'm still curious about how the trilogy started. Did, yeah. you from the, did you know from the beginning that you wanted to make a series of films or how much did you know where you were going to go? Yeah, I mean, I really had no idea. I mean, what, you know, I was living in New York. I was, um, uh, I was editing another film, the film about gentrification um, in 2002. We released it in 2003. And I was just um, following closely what was happening in the country and how the country was responding. Um, and particularly the lead up to the Iraq war, which I, I felt, I mean, I, I went into a deep depression. I thought that these, there were really things that were happening that, um, that historically um, were incredibly problematic. I mean, the idea of using preemptive military force because you think a country might be, you know, an aggressor and then the, the lack of any kind of a connection between Iraq and 9-11 and, 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 but then to sort of see the, the government moving towards, um, towards invading and then, and then also in the context of seeing, you know, millions of people protesting but that not meaning anything mm -hmm. that you, you know, that we had, there were so many people took to the streets and, and nothing had happened and I was, you know, watching all that and, um, and I, it, I just felt in a sense that I had um, both a desire as an artist or as an American or as a citizen to communicate about what I was experiencing and what I was feeling and what I felt um, needed to be said at that moment. And so in a way it was an outlet to make a film about it. Um, and then I also felt as a, as a documentarian, it had, it, it had a certain value that to, to, to understand what this war meant, not from an ideological perspective back in the US, but actually what did it mean for the people whose lives were on the line. And, uh, and, and so I felt compelled to, to make this film. And I, you know, it, in retrospect, it, it, it um, you know, there, was, there were a lot of risks in doing it. I mean, to, to go to Iraq at, at that point. I mean, it was, I went um, in the spring of 2004 um, and was stay there for, for eight months documenting, documenting the war. And, and I went um, with a camera. I was doing my own filming, so I went alone. I wasn't going with a crew. Um, and with the idea of trying to maybe get around the sort of ideological debate and, and understand, you know, what this meant on human terms and, 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 and thinking that that has some value, like what do people, um, 
not just how, do they, how are we arguing about these events, but what are their real, real world consequences? And, and then also, you know, there was a lot of, um, you know, contradictory rhetoric about this idea that we were going to occupy Iraq to bring democracy. And I just thought, like, how, is it, how are we even having this conversation? And it seems so flawed in its logic. Um, but but I, would, I would definitely say that like, the real motivating force for, for, for going there was not like a political agenda or something like that. Like, I, just, I just felt like, compelled I did, that, that, I was, that I was sort of pulled in that direction and to, to make the film. Uh, did you know, <clears throat> I mean, I'm just uh, trying yeah, so to imagine. Point, right, yeah, so um, I didn't imagine this to be um, uh, a larger body of work. I was actually, when I was making the, the trying to like figure out logistics of how to get to Iraq, um, it was also when Guantanamo was, um, was, it had been open and they were, I was receiving some uh, emails that there were going to be military tribunals in Guantanamo and this is 2003 and it's like we're still waiting for the military tribunals that haven't happened. Mm -hmm. but, um, but I was also very interested in saying like, okay, should I make something about Guantanamo or should I do something about Iraq? And they were both, I, I felt, um, you know, sort of historical moments that should be documented and that we need to engage them in different ways than I was seeing that the mainstream media was doing which was more cheerleading um, about, about the build-up to the war. And, uh, and so when I went to Iraq, I, no, I had no idea um, that this would be sort of um, themes that I'd be returning to or that this country would still be going down certain paths that it has been. Um, I, just, I, I, was, I thought I was making one film about, about the Iraq war, and it wasn't until... I, um, had, I was coming back and was uh, editing the footage in, in 2005 when I just kind of knew, I said, the next thing I have to do is has to be about Guantanamo. And it was at that point that I, that I sort of said, okay, this is going to be a, a trilogy of films that I'm going to you know, sort of document what does the, you know, the war on terror, what does it look like and how do we understand it from, um, from a different perspective. The process is always... Um that you are in the middle of a situation, it's like a historical moment, but it's a situation that's evolving, you don't know where it's going. Um, it's an unlikely place to be, probably organizationally, structurally. I, I wonder, like, it's filled with conflict, anxiety, even though there's something that will keep you going. Did you go to Baghdad and think uh, this will sort of come together and be about the democratic so-called election or how do you go? What do you know when you start? Do you know you're going to mm -hmm. stay nine months or? Yeah. <laughs> um, the answer is no. no uh -huh. there's, basically there's a whole lot of uncertainty. When I, when I go into a project um, I have particular interest and, um, and looking for certain types of things or, or trying to identify people who I could, if I were to film, that I would sort of get some answers into the questions that I was interested in. And this one was the sort of contradiction between occupying the country and saying that we're going to bring democracy to the Middle East. Um, so, but going to Iraq, I, you know, I didn't have like, oh, I, I have, I'm going to be filming this person, this person, this person. That's a process of kind of, you know, going and, and meeting people and spending time and hoping that, you know, in that sort of process um, that you find people that will sort of pull you in on a journey. So there's a lot of, a tremendous amount of uncertainty in the, um, in, in what ultimately un unfolds, which is, I mean, for me, like what I love about Cinema Verte documentary and Cinema Verte is when you're following events in real time as they're unfolding. Is, is the way in which they mirror our lives, our daily lives, because in our daily lives, we don't know what's gonna happen the next day or the next week. I mean, there is this sort of sense of uncertainty and we're trying to navigate all that uncertainty and that it, with Cinema Verte, you, you sort of are there for those moments of uncertainty and then you have the possibility like down the road when you're in the editing room is to find meaning in it, right? And to, and to tell like, oh, this is, this is what happened or this is how we can understand it, which I think is what we do in our daily lives as well. Like we can sort of, we can narrate like how it is that we've, we've all come to the, be in this room today. Like what were the things? Did, you know, there was something led to something else that, something th that you're here, you know someone. And that there's a certain kind of, you find a, um, a coherence or a narrative in retrospect, but in the present tense, you, you experience uncertainty and doubt and fear and all those kinds of things. And, and those are all the kind of building blocks of what, how you sort of understand 
basic, you know, the human condition um, and, and, and it's the foundation of storytelling that people have been doing for a long time. So, um, so making these films are very much, you know, mirror what's sort of more just the uncertainty of going through life, but they, but I, I, I have certain principles that guide them that make it, that I feel like I have some pillars that I'm holding on to. One of them um, being that, I mean, not in all cases, but often cases, there is some kind of a um, theme that I'm interested in, and then in often cases, it's some kind of a, uh, an arc or a plot. And so in this case, in going to Iraq, I was interested in documenting the US assistance of the election process um, and to sort of document that. And the uncertainty of doing that is, you know, A, the elections could have maybe never happened, um, they could have taken five years and not one year, you know, and then I'd be making a film for five years because you sort of like once you sort of get married to a plot then you kind of have to see it out. Um, and so there's that and then I'm always, I mean my films are usually about, I'm interested in how individuals are experiencing things and people who are directly impacted by things and how through those, through spending time with people um, you, can, you can understand big themes. And so there is sort of like a, this sort of dialectical relationship between the, sort of the individual and the bigger themes that are, um, that, you know, that are impacting. So in, in the Iraq war, it was, you know, the occupation as the big theme and then, you know, citizens and, and, and individuals. And so, so then, then, then the challenge is in, on the ground is, okay, who are the individuals that I can, you know, that will open their, um, their lives that I can spend time with and that will give, that will, answer some of the questions that I'm seeking. And, and, and I'm often like very much not interested in, you know, um, uh, finding people who believe the same things I believe, but who will answer questions that I have. So there's a lot of things where there's a learning process. Like you, like you go, I go in with certain preconceptions and then once I'm in the field, then you kind of have to like throw them out of the window because they're, you know, they're, they don't hold up. And so as an American going to Iraq, I had to sort of then uh, recalibrate once I was talking to Iraqis. What did the occupation mean for them? What did the elections mean for them? Not what, did, not what did it mean for me? Um, so, so, so the looking, f you know, different themes, having some basic ideas, looking for individuals that I can f film with, um, and then and trying to um, be in the right place where I can find that. And so, but, but. But all that is to say, there's still also a lot of uncertainty. So in, when I went to, when I arrived in Iraq, I had, I had gone there, I had approached um, the US military seeking um, access to film their civil affairs unit. And the civil affairs unit are the part in the military the, uh, that are doing non-military work. So you have doctors, lawyers, um, and who, who in the Iraq context were trying to like help you know, set up the elections or help build their infrastructure. And so I had gotten permission to film with them from the US military, and which in itself was an interesting process. Like, how do you just mm -hmm. knock on the door of the military and you say, can I come and film what you guys are doing? And you, you actually can just knock on the door, um, and which is what I did. And then I got, I got to Iraq and I was in the, what's called, what's called the green zone. I don't know if they call it that anymore. Um, and I, then I realized like the Americans had created a prison for themselves. Like they were like inside these barricaded, you know, blast walls, totally separate from Iraq, which was the quote unquote red zone. And, and how little interaction there was, or when there was interaction, there was interaction with a whole lot of guns between, you know, people. And, uh, and I thought like, <coughs> all right, like I really have a problem here because that's not the film I want to make. Like I don't want to make a film that replicates the idea that that the entire country of Iraq should be called the red zone and that you have to have a lot of guns if you want to meet um, Iraqi civilians. So I had a, you know, I had a, I had a dilemma, and, but I didn't really know how to solve it um, because I didn't have lots of local contacts. I mean, I thought I was going to be focusing on the U.S. sort of nation building project in Iraq. That was the original theme. Um, and, uh, and then the, what, who the person who became the main protagonist, it was, it was the series of circumstances that I, were, what, that I met him. So I was told by somebody in the military that there was gonna be an inspection of Abu Ghraib prison. And this was right, like about a month after the, the photographs were published. So it was, you know, a, a huge scandal. Um, and that they were gonna have an inspection by, led by Iraqis. 
and and it was going to be uh, you know it wasn't open for the it wasn't open to the press it wasn't like you know it wasn't a um, you know like a photo op and uh, and so this you know person from the military says well you know it's going to be really hard for you to get permission but if you want write me send me an email and um, and I'll see if I can get you access to this in, um, inspection and. Uh, and so I wrote a bunch of emails, and it went up chains of command, and I saw lots of people who said, you know, I saw your email, you know, good luck, it's probably not gonna happen. And, and in the end, um, I, I was actually able to document this inspection. And uh, there was a group of, you know, maybe two dozen Iraqis who were, went to Abu Ghraib and were sort of interviewing prisoners um, over the fence. And in the process is when I met Dr. Dr. Riyadh, who became the, the central, um, um, person prot protagonist in the film My Country, My Country, and when we were there, he, you know, he just said, "If you want to know what's happening, then you should come to my medical clinic." And and he extended this an invitation, and and so after this, then I began this very um, interesting um, uh, shift of realities between filming uh, inside the green zone with the military, with the UN, who were. Um, uh, building the, um, the infrastructure for the elections, and then just walking outside of the green zone, I, you know, trying to not draw attention to myself as a Westerner, and just walk outside the green zone, and then meet, you know, meet somebody from the family, and then and then be filming um, in Baghdad uh, with Dr. Riyadh and his family, and I just went back and forth um, over several months, and that's when I knew that, like, once I met him and started mm -hmm. filming with him, and particularly in his medical clinic, is when I knew I had a film. You know, before that, I was still just trying to find what would be the um, the, the the way through in terms of the what I was going to tell, and so that's so so there, and then and then. Um, once I was filming with him, and I thought he would be sort of the main protagonist. Then my, you know, as a filmmaker, I just tried to stay close to him and, and what was happening to him, um, and uh, that I knew he would be sort of the, pris the the lens through which the film would unfold, which was, I mean, complicated. That I mean, there's a language, there was a language issue because I wasn't I wasn't working with an interpreter at this point when I was in um, Iraq. It was a time when interpreters were being murdered, like mercilessly, you know, it was like really horrible. I mean, there were interpreters who worked inside the green zone who would get into three different taxi cabs because they were, um, what was happening is they were being followed so that they could be murdered. So they have to go to three different taxi cabs and then get in, and then, and then they would work and then they would go home and then they would have the situation where their friends would be, you know, ripped out of cars and brutally um, uh, killed, uh, and it was just, the, the, it was really horrendous. And so I didn't want to um, risk somebody else in terms of doing that, so I was filming with the family um, without a, a translator, um, and so I, I was really having to go by, you know, a sense of, you know, like, what, where I felt the, the emotional drama was, because there was a lot of situations where I, I didn't understand the full context. The doctor did speak English, and so he could tell me after the fact what had happened, but when we were, and I was actually filming, um, like, in his, in his medical clinic, I, I, was, I was shooting um, without, um, I, I found out what the dialogue was after when we were in the, in the editing room. So it's, um, yeah, not just uncertainty, but also highly improbable to, to meet these people. If I think of like the camera as a distance, has a distancing effect normally, the, the lack of shared language as a distancing effect and, and the country is occupied and I can only imagine the amount of suspicion any American person might be met with. And um, you told us a little bit about Dr. Riyadh, I'm curious, like how, how is it possible to overcome all this? Um, I mean, you were speaking about like a full commitment because you go and you're committed to that you're going. Um, I mean, the, the answer to that is different with each project. I mean, in this case, um, Dr. Riyadh, he was, um, he was already taking enormous risks with his life. He was somebody who was agreeing to participate in the political process, um, which was, um, it, led to many people being assassinated. And he was also one of the rare people who stood up regularly um, and questioned what the US government was doing. He would have arguments with soldiers, you see it in the film. And what I've experienced in, in many other cases that Iraqis would have criticisms but they wouldn't express them to Americans. They would, you know, you'd hear it later. And so and he, was, he would be constantly saying, you know, questioning the occupation. And, um, and so, 
uh, he, you know, so in his, it's like he saw like, okay, the, you know, Iraq is, you know, suffering at, you know, and he's risking his life, and he knew that the world wasn't paying attention, and so he thought like, okay, well, uh, like, uh, this will add more risk, but at the same time, it potentially reaches an outside world um, in terms of what's happening. So that was so he uh, he really in, you know invited me into um, into filming because I, he felt that the situation was so dire that it was worth the risk. And and you're right that it was you know it wasn't um, a time when you had a lot of um, Americans um, you know in Baghdad that weren't being you know, didn't have lots of armed guards with them. Um, I wanted to see what you would say about how you would meet the protagonist in each film, because it's always a, the protagonist, almost like a portrait. You could think of your work as a portraiture in a way, and so meeting the protagonist is what is at, at the core of the film, and in each of the three films you've met them or have had an encounter with them different ways. Could you speak about it a little bit? Yeah, I mean, so so with so the film that I made after My Country, My Country, I made a film that was dealt with um, Guantanamo and the war on terror and themes of well, and Al Qaeda and torture and um, and it, it followed two people. Um, one um, uh, was a prisoner at Guantanamo, who you um, in a sense is a ghost in the film. You hear his voice and you see a couple images, but he's basically a ghost. Mm -hmm. And, and his brother-in-law, um, a man named Abu Jandal, who was in, in Yemen driving a taxi cab. And Abu Jandal was um, uh, bin Laden's former bodyguard and was the person who recruited um, Salim Hamdan, who was the prisoner um, at, at Guantanamo. And so there's this, 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 th those are the two protagonists. And it, I mean, again, there was a, a lot of, um, the, the story came just by going into the field. So I initially said I wanted to make a film about Guantanamo and I was interested in a film about people, c like what would happen like to follow somebody returning home from Guantanamo. And I, then I, did, that was what I was, the, the story that I was interested in telling. And I went to Yemen because that's, Yemen is the, the place where there's the largest com composi um, population of prisoners from Guantanamo. And I just thought, well, there, you know, at some point they, there, there will be some who will go home. And um, so I made a trip there with a human rights lawyer, um, David Reams, who makes an appearance in the short that um, is called Death of a Prisoner that, um, that I published for the New York Times about Guantanamo. And we met with many families and because um, he was updating them. He, had, he, had, he, he went to the prison and then he would go to Yemen and he would meet with the families and he would update them about what was happening in those cases. And so I went there with the thought that I would meet the families and try to find out what would be, you know, meet them and say, could I, could I film when when people come home. And uh, that was the uh, initial sort of uh, idea that I thought I was making of the film. And I also had an idea that I was looking for somebody who was, you know, clearly, um, you know, the wrong person. Like, the, the, you know, like we know of so many cases of Guantanamo where people were sort of sold for bounty and had nothing to do with Al Qaeda. I mean, I was looking for that kind of a, a narrative. Um, and then once I got to Yemen on the, in the first week there, um, was um, invited to meet somebody who's Salim Hamdan's brother, or, or Salim, Salim Hamdan's family, and, um, and I knew Salim Hamdan's case because it was a, a well-known Supreme Court case, and so I said, of course, I wanted to meet, and that's when I was um, introduced to Abu Jandal, who became the protagonist of the film, and, and it became, which is a radically different film than I had set out to make, which was a film about, like, okay, this is not somebody who was, you know, the wrong guy, the wrong place. He was actually, you know, from, from Saudi Arabia, um, a jihadist, went to Afghanistan, met, met bin Laden, worked as his bodyguard, and then ultimately kind of renounced um, uh, the, the violence of 9-11, but it's not that clear that that's mm -hmm. what he's done. I mean, it's a very complicated case, and he's also sort of a pivotal figure in the sort of 9-11 history because right after 9-11, he, he had been um, imprisoned in Yemen um, before 9-11, and then after the attacks happened, um, he was interrogated by um, the U.S., uh, but particularly by somebody named Ali Soufan, who worked for the FBI, and six days after 9-11, he was interrogated, and they read him his Miranda rights, and, and then he gave this, like, lengthy, um, um, you know, interview, which, which provided an extraordinary amount of intelligence so early on. You know, this was before, this is in the window when those images that I was, you know, that you see on the screen were being filmed. This was before we started 
invading Afghanistan. This was like in the immediate aftermath where you think that maybe the, you know, the, the urge to, you know, waterboard or do any of the things that happened later would be the strongest. And, and, but in fact, what happened was he was read his Miranda rights and this extraordinary interrogation took place um, that actually changed, um, you know, the events of, in Afghanistan. And, and I knew about it. I knew that that was his backstory. So when I met him um, in Yemen, because uh, I, um, I learned, so he was, he was free at that point, and he was driving a taxi cab. And, I, and there was just something to me that was completely fascinating about this, this person, this person who you know, was so close um, to sort of the inner core, who was driving a taxi cab, and where we know that there are so many people in Guantanamo who you know, re really were not, you know, hadn't trained and weren't associated. And so I became really fascinated with, with this person, and it became a much more of a, of more of a contradictory narrative. I mean, it was, as I think you could call it like an anti-hero, you know, like this is a guy who you didn't really trust. Um, but was also fascinating at the same time, and I thought um, provided some really, really interesting insights because, it, you know, for me the question was how, like somebody who was, it, it was a lesson in somebody who was so aligned but actually renounced some of the, the tactics um, that, um, of Al Qaeda. So I was interested in that, I was interested in understanding that. So that you know, definitely opened, like it was a much sort of darker narrative than, than the film that I made in Iraq. Um, and so, um, so I asked to, to film with him and, you know, there was, he, um, it took a long time for me to get access. Um, that was like, I was, I was patient. I kept coming back to Yemen and saying I was here and I wanted, and you know, and it took, I, you know, a, a long time for me to get the access that I need to make that film. And what, <clears throat> what do you mean when you speak about access? Is this well, just building a relationship slowly, or is it more on the government level to be allowed into yeah, certain Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it wasn't that. I mean, like, well, I mean, when I was traveling to Yemen, I was, I was staying under the radar. I didn't alert to, to the government that I was, you know, making a, a documentary. I, I just sort of, you know, went in on a tourist visa and found a place to stay. Um, it's the kind of it's the kind of place where you're supposed to have minders if you're doing journalism there. Um, so I tried to stay under the radar, um, and uh, and what I'm but by access it was like I needed. To, I mean, the thing I really wanted to do is have a camera in his taxi cab. I mean, like that's what that's because I was really interested in driving around in his taxi cab and see what would happen. Like that was that was like the immediate like through line and. Um, and the other through line or the other sort of narrative plot line was happening as I, um, we followed the, the trial. There was a trial um, of the other protagonist, Salim Hamdan, in Guantanamo. So he, was, he went through military tribunal. And uh, so we were also working on how to get access to film at Guantanamo. And so those, you know, so that we could get um, a camera crew there. And that was, um, had its own challenges. Um, and uh, so it was... And, and, and in a way, like the, the, the fact that there was a trial gave it sort of, again, an arc, but that wasn't really the story. It kind of serves as a kind of a red herring first for, like you sort of, you have that as, as sort of an architecture but of, of a story, but the real story was a backstory of Abu Jandal, like who he was and why he did what he did and to sort of slowly reveal that. And then he also allowed you to film him as a teacher, is that the right term, where he has a group of young yeah. men he yeah. talks to regularly, yeah. and was, was that equally difficult to... Yeah, you know, I mean, it was, I mean, that, yeah, I mean, he said, like, yeah, I, you know, I do these teachings, like, on every week, you know, young people come and they hang out, and I was like, oh, I'd like to film that, and you know, it took a little, it took a bit of time for, for that to happen, um, and, uh, and that was an interesting context, mm -hmm. I mean, and that, I mean, I was definitely... I mean, in, in both working in, in Iraq and in Yemen, I was kind of a bit out of place. I mean, you know, a woman working alone in these kinds of environments, it's like, it's like, it, it, um, it's not something that happens all the time. And, and I think particularly in Yemen, they were curious, like, you know, because it's really gender segregated. And, um, and, uh, and so, you know, I think that there was a kind of like, they were actually interested in, um, in what I had to think and what, what I was doing mm -hmm. because it was so unusual. Um, from their perspective. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you also spoke about how each film opened the door to the next film. Yeah. Like when My Country, My Country was screened also uh, by Al Jazeera, it was seen by right. some people in Yemen, so it allowed you to get into yeah. Yemen and 
Yeah, I mean, I think it, it built a certain kind of trust that, that people had seen it in Yemen, um, seen the film that I'd made in Iraq, which opened that door. And then, you know, ironically, after making the film that I made um, in, in, in Iraq, before I started working on, on the oath, I was, put, I was placed on this watch list, this US government watch list, which, you know, sort of ironically sort of led to making the film about Snowden, you know, being on a watch list and having to um, navigate that and the choices that I made and sort of being, you know, it, 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 it was probably the thing that, um, you know, in the end caused Snowden to contact me. Because of the article that... Because of, yeah, I mean, so there's probably, uh, yeah, I mean, reasons. so so in terms of, so, you know, with <laughs> Citizen Four, it's actually was a different set of circumstances. Usually I, um, am, I go someplace and I try to meet people and I say, can I film with you? And, and with Citizen Four, with Snowden, it was actually quite different. Um, I started receiving anonymous emails um, by somebody saying that he, he had evidence of NSA, um, uh, you know, wrongdoing. And he... Um, he didn't actually approach me because he wanted to be in a film. He actually he approached me because he was looking for a journalist that he felt would be um, who, who understood the issues and who would not back down in terms of publishing. And he was did that in the context of you know what we know about um, some you know mainstream media organizations. Um, complying with government wishes not to publish certain stories. And, you know, we know about the case of the, the warrantless wiretapping where the New York Times didn't publish it for a year. And so Snowden was looking to, to work with journalists who, wouldn't, who um, wouldn't make those choices. And so he'd reached out to Glenn Greenwald first, and that didn't, that they weren't able to connect with encryption. And then he, he found me. And, um, and probably through a combination of um, reading a story that Glenn wrote about my being on a watch list, along with um, the, the piece, the program that, that we're showing in, the, in this room, which was about the NSA. It's a short um, uh, piece about um, NSA whistleblower and, and NSA spying, and that I published in the Times in the, in the summer of 2012, along with an essay about, um, that referenced the fact that I was on a, on a watch list. And, so I think those were the, the things that that's why he reached out to me. But I think he reached out. He, well, he was looking for somebody to you know do um, print journalism with this. And he said these were documents. These were stories. These were news stories. And it, it, it the, me asking him to actually be able to film him was actually something that wasn't part of our initial conversation. I mean, our initial conversation, I thought he was always going to remain an anonymous source and I would never meet him. And it wasn't until, you know, several months later that he said he was going to reveal his identity. And then, and then I, I, you know, I said, well, if you're going to do that, then really I want to meet you and film. And he said no. And there was a bit of back and forth and he ultimately, he ultimately agreed to, to let me film. So, um, so he didn't approach me because I'm, I, I do visual journalism. I think it was because I had been working on the, the, these kinds of themes for a long time. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> you've always worked as a discrete person to, to make your films, and now that has certainly changed. Are you, like, what is it like thinking about the work that you want to do in the future? Do you think you, it's, a, it's a very different situation, or are you not even quite... Yeah, I mean, I think it's there, just. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I have in the past sort of done this kind of under the radar approach to to making films, going places, and and trying not to attract too much attention. Um, and so, I, obviously, that's going to shift. That's you know shift because I'm, I'm. It's going to be hard for me to fly under the radar. Um, and uh, but I don't know yet. I mean, I think that it's too soon for me to know how it will impact. You know, the the work. I mean, I mean, in general. Um, like you know, when you're when you're in the field shooting, I mean, it's really just about you know, like a human connection, and mm -hmm. so I think that that's probably still possible. Like, <laughs> I hope. Uh, this is more of a formal question. You um, uh, have spoken about uh, your films also as primary documents, or at least when you shoot the footage that you have, you think of it as primary a, pr a primary document, and you likened it to me to war photography once, which I thought was interesting. I don't know if there's something like war film or how one could translate that, um, since that sort of acknowledges, of course, there's a, a point of view that makes a so-called primary document. Um, is there war film or are there uh, art photo like war photographers that you admire or... 
I mean, I mean, when I think about you know the comparing it to what people do in, in in war photography, it's I mean, it's like the difference between visual journalism and print journalism. In in visual journalism, you're I mean, there are there are facts. You have facts. You know, if you're if you're filming in Iraq during the war, you're taking photographs. There, are the, what's in the frame? I mean, you could call it. We, I mean, theoretically, you could argue that it's a photograph. But but I think that we can say that there's some, you know, that there there's journalism happening. Um, uh, because you're documenting uh, a reality. But then there's also interpretive um, uh, expression that's happening, and that's what I'm interested in. You know, like that kind of balance between having a, you know, real, you know, journalistic primary document that says, okay, this is a, this is what Guantanamo looks like. This is, or this is what we can see of Guantanamo. Or this is what the, you know, uh, Iraq looks like under occupation in these years. Um, or this is what it looks like in the hotel room when a journalist meets a source and they talk about top secret documents. I mean, they are, they're, they're, you know, they're kind of, you know, they, 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 you know, there's their, their journalistic, you know, material, but they're also then, you know, how to approach them, um, how to film them, how to, how to frame them, those then become the sort of more aesthetic choices that, um, that go into, into, into the work. So I'm interested in both those things. I'm interested in creating primary documents, like having a record, um, that it's important to have a record. Um, and then how to, from, from those primary documents, build um, narratives or stories that you can um, understand sort of more the, the nuances or the, emo the, the emotional complexities that, that are contained in that. Mm -hmm. so. so there are, of course, many more primary documents than film, film material <laughs> yeah. um, to be seen what will happen with <laughs> those in, in the terms future. Of, yeah, um, I mean, I, I don't know yet. I mean, um, there's always a way in which, like, you know, when you, when you finish a film, you, you step away from, you know, mm -hmm. all the, the, all the research and, and, uh, and, do, and get on to the next thing. So, um, so I'm not sure. I mean, there, there, for sure, there's um, lots of, like, footage I'd like to revisit. Um, uh, from all of from all the films that that I've done, um, so I mean, so for instance, e in my country, my country, I, I, there's a scene in that shot in Abu Ghraib prison, and the scene is whatever four minutes long, but I was there and I filmed for an hour and a half, you know, and I, inside the prison, inside the hospital, and you know, that's I'm, I, I haven't gone back to that footage, and I would like to go back to it. Um, in in the hotel room with with um, Glenn Greenwald and Snowden, I filmed, you know, there's. 20 hours of, of raw footage that I'd like to at some point go back and, and see about releasing. So, but at this point, I haven't um, had time to sort of reflect on it or, or go back into, into that material. I feel like between the lines, uh, we've been sliding between art, documentary, yeah. film, journalism. These are all, of course, related, overlapping, but also distinct areas. Um, I mean, you could think about audience does it matter to you very much which audience you're thinking about or do you have a different um, response to the different kind of reception you, or or is it more you're doing the work and the work travels the way that the nature of the work allows it to yeah I mean I think it's pretty consistent like I, that you know I feel like as a as a filmmaker and as an artist what I'm trying to do with the work is to express something about the world that I see or that the world that I find myself in and so that's the real primary sort of like how can I fully express that and then and then the audience then becomes the you know if if the expression gets articulated and gets heard and that's like that's like I don't change the expression because of who I you know before an audience but but it's definitely trying to to reach someone it's like saying like okay we need to pay attention to this what does this mean and 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 how can I articulate it in a way that will land and and have some meaning I like have um, emotional meaning have intellectual meaning um, and so it's it's just about trying to articulate like what I what I witness and what I experience and what I want to say about a situation and so um, and, and but it's and it's very much I think I'm very like my main audience for this body of work. I feel like as a as an American citizen and sort of documenting nine post nine eleven America, I'm really interested in you know communicating to other American citizens. I think that's my primary um, you know if I were to define an audience the sort of first audience. Um, and I'm sort of I'm critical of there's a 
long documentary tradition of going to other places and making films about other people. And, and then walking away and bringing them home and then everybody sort of watches and, and there's sort of this um, severing of any relationship to those other people or that other political context and then people watch the movies and then they feel good about themselves and then, you know, because they were sympathetic to those people and it doesn't really change power dynamics and I'm really interested in ways in which to try to implicate the audience and so that we have to kind of come to terms with the, you know, the world that we're creating as American citizens globally and 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 that you're you're not just sort of a passive observer but you're kind of implicated in the narrative and um, and so I'm, I'm more interested in in that kind of implication and then also building not sort of lines of sympathy but lines of empathy so that you can understand people as you know like what would I mean, what would New Yorkers do if we didn't have electricity for like four years? Or we maybe had electricity like for three hours a day? Like, would we get along? Do you think we'd be, there would be some violence? You know, probably. And, you know, I mean, like, so what, would, what would imagine if we were in those situations? And so what are the ways to do that? Um, so, I'm, so I'm interested in, you know, as an American, uh, sort of documenting this as sort of my primary, I think, um, uh, what I think is important rather than... Um, you know, going to other places. and uh, You told me you did screenings uh, to the Iraqi people and also, if I understood correctly, to the U.S. Army. Yep. So these are all... Quite, do you have a sense of the reception? Were you, were you there? Was it that intimate or...? Yeah, I mean, I did screenings, you know, with all my... I mean, the... the, the um, you know, screening of military colleges was really interesting. I mean, they were interested because it gave an into, uh, insight into what the occupation looked like, um, and uh, and 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 that was interesting. And then and, and and Iraqis really did respond to it. I mean, they saw like they saw themselves in you know, um, in in the images, and and I think that um, like. I mean, what I do try to do when I'm sort of in the field shooting, I mean, there is another thing that happens often in documentary f filmmaking or photography where you go to a, a place and people like give you the outsider tour and which is where, you know, you get the world that nobody actually ever lives and you're like, oh, here's like, you know, people don't really, it's not their normal lives and like you have an outsider and you get a tour and like that's what they, and it's kind of like becomes an expectation, like people think, you know, that the journalists want the outsider tour and then you get the outsider tour and you actually don't understand anything about the real situation. And so I'm, I'm definitely trying not to get that, you know. And, and I think that oftentimes when I'm shooting, people are like, what is she doing? You know, like, she's, she's always here. Like, there's, like, nothing <laughs> happening. And, you know, um, and, and it takes, you know, like, I have to just, like, it's like, you know, it's okay. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, don't, don't worry, don't worry. Um, and, and that, you know, that would often, you know, often happen because people think things aren't interesting. <laughs> and um, when in fact they were, um, and they often, and they often are, and so by trying to get, you know, to get outside of out of that outsider tour, an example of it would be like when I would film in the in in Iraq in the doctor's office. I would film these really incredible scenes where he was taking vital signs and they, they were talking about like their physical pain and then it would always morph into, yeah, I couldn't sleep last night because the bombs were going off and then they raided the house next door and it became these sort of anecdotes that were just like, you know, cinematically amazing, you know, like windows into, into what it was like to be um, living under occupation. And then they would, you know, I'd film all this stuff and then, the, you know, the doctor would turn to me and then he would say, I'd like to introduce you to so and so. She's a teacher at the you know local college, and then it was like, and I'd have to tell him like, no, I don't want that th that introduction. Like I, I had to just like say like that's not. I want to film that, you know, her coming in and talking about you know where she had pain and what had happened to her the night before, and and and, and sort of sort of shift those expectations. The being around and people wondering what is she doing is like nothing is happening. Yeah. You, you sound a lot like an artist in, in that <laughs> moment, actually. <laughs> um, I also wanted to talk to you specifically about like showing work in art spaces uh, since we're sitting in one and you're showing uh, the trilogy and the work around it. And you're also working with Jay Sanders on an exhibition for the Whitney for next year. Um, it must be different to respond to context like this rather than, um, you know, other formats of screening. Um. Yeah, I mean, I really, it's actually, I really like it because I, I think people often think about my film because it deals with political issues that, that I go in with, like, 
um, with like I'm trying to, I have an agenda and I'm making films because I have an agenda and I don't. I actually make films because I want to make films. And, um, and I want to talk about like this sort of art or the aesthetics of it. And, and I feel like that's really what drives me. Like when I think of, if a, if a film I make, you know, is, it, it fails or succeeds, it's going to be whether or not it works as a piece of art, you know? And what does it communicate anything? And, um, and, th and that's like, that's always the sort of the goal. And that's the, what I expect when I, when I go and see a film or, or see a piece of art, like I want it to communicate something to me. I don't want it to just, you know, deliver some sort of message and, or, you know, or have an agenda. And, um, and, and so, I mean, I'm really, um, I mean, one of the things that is, is, a, is a struggle doing long form documentary is the kind of constraints of narrative. I mean, it's really, it's brutally relentless. Like you, you know, you, you, you can have, you know, incredible amount of footage, but you know, like in a, in a, in a film, you're gonna have a scene and it's gonna be, have to, you're gonna have to make really hard choices. And the thing that I'm really, um, is actually, I mean, back up a little bit. When I started receiving these, um, these emails from Snowden and um, before I met him and before, when I still thought he was gonna remain anonymous, I started journaling. And all the journaling was going towards doing installation work. It was like, I, like that was how I responded to receiving these emails. Like it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to, this is going to find its way into a narrative. And so I started doing all this, this journaling and, and thinking like, oh, I'm, I know I'm going to make an art piece. Uh, and then I reached out to, to Jay before I went to Hong Kong and I said, you know, I'd love to just, you know, just talk to you about what, you know, like some ideas I have and in terms of trying to see if, if I could do something in a, in a less linear context, um, in a gallery context. And, you know, that's kind of was a sort of the first seed and then I sort of disappeared and then, you know, went and met Snowden and um, did some reporting and, uh, and then he, he contacted me. <laughs> Um, and said, yeah, you know that idea that we were talking about? And it's like, you know, do you want to, are you still interested? And I mean, it was really amazing because it was kind of, you know, a continuation. And it also was, the th like, the, it actually felt like throughout all of doing this reporting that it, it made much, like, I knew I was making a film about it, but like how to, how to grapple with the archive, how to grapple with um, this, this, you know, the vast quantity of material, and then also just wanting to be a little bit liberated from the constraints of, of a narrative, um, a, you know, linear uh, plot, and, and, and just wanting to sort of work some different muscles um, creatively. And so that's how I sort of started talking to, to Jay about, and, you know, doing, doing that with, um, with him at, at the Whitney. So I'm really excited about it, and, you know, uh, appropriately nervous. <laughs> Well, this is actually the last question I had in mind because I um, have a feeling there might be um, a good amount of questions in the audience and um, maybe it's a good moment to open up and let some others also ask their question. Uh, I might actually just start with a question if that's okay. <laughs> um, I wanted to actually ask about The Intercept a little bit yeah. because it seems that... Um, the way in which The Intercept started after the NSA revelations kind of revealed this need for a new kind of media approach, a new, that perhaps formed around Glenn Greenwald and his activity outside the normal realm of journalism in Washington and so on. Yeah. Um, and I wonder how that felt, feels to you as, as a necessity or, or how your, your work relates to that, you know, yeah. as a kind of visual form of journalism. Yeah, I mean, a few things about that. I mean, I do think that one of the, the sort of things that was unique about what happened with, with Snowden was that he reached out to people that were sort of outside of the mainstream. So me and Glenn, rather than going, you know, um, right to mainstream journalists, meant that it kind of unfolded a little bit differently. And I felt like, and I, and I feel and I hope that there was kind of maybe of a reinvigorating of adversarial journalism in terms of how um, this story unfolded. And I also think um, that yeah, and that, so in that, in that context, in the way that The Intercept came about, I mean, I think Glenn and I wanted to continue that work. And um, I mean, I'm certainly interested in trying to bring visual journalism to The Intercept, which actually hasn't happened yet. And it's something that I'm really hoping that they're going to, you know, be willing to sort of gamble a bit more on. Um, but I, I do think that to have a bit of, you know, that, that it's not just the New York Times or just the Washington Post that are, that are breaking stories, but that other people are breaking them. But for me, the I think the, the real thing of why I, I believe in what we're doing there is 
like our commitment to source protection and um, secure communication to protect sources and our commitment to publish, you know? I mean, that's, those, those I think are the, you know, sort of the key things that, I, that I'm really committed to, to doing with, with them. Um, but I'm also, I feel like it is a bit, um, like I'm, I, I still don't, you know, I'm, I've been doing a lot of print journalism, but it's a bit alien. I mean, I'm really, I consider myself a visual artist and a visual journalist, and so I want to bring that to, to the site. Any questions from the audience? Hand, hands up, please. Hi, I'm curious because you were on the no-fly list before how it's been. Well, I was on a watch list, not a no-fly list. Oh, okay. But anyway, how has it been traveling to the United States now yeah. after making... So, so I was stopped. I was on the watch. On the, I was on what's called the selectee list, um, uh, uh, and for, was stopped every time I traveled for six years. Um, and uh, it actually stopped after Glenn wrote a, a piece about it, um, about my detentions. And this was before Snowden contacted me. So he he. He reached out to me, which was a good experience, like as a to be sort of on the flip side of being, in a sense, the subject. Because he said, you know, you really should write about this, you know, or you should let me write about it. You should talk about your experience. And I was, I was very hesitant because it's like once you go public, there's no dialing. You can't just, you can't take it back. And I was worried that it could um, make it so that I couldn't work under the radar, or that it would create a worse situation. But it was actually created um, enough of an outcry that I, I stopped being detained at the airport every time I traveled. Um, but, uh, and then once um, this Snowden came forward and after Hong Kong, I, w I was, I had already relocated to Berlin because of the watch list situation because I had had my um, computers and electronics taken so many, well, I've had them taken and I've had my notebooks photocopied and been interrogated so many times that I didn't feel like I could work on this material in the US and cross the border and, 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 and um, remain with my obligation to protect source material. So, um, but I haven't had problems since, since I've come back. Um, I, I, did, I did not come back to the US immediately after Hong Kong, but after um, 10 months, Glenn and I got on a plane and, and we flew together with a lawyer and, um, and neither of us were stopped or questioned, which is good. Who are your cinematic or documentary influences, mentors or uh, influences? Um, so, I mean, I love the tradition, the cinema verite tradition, what these got like, what Penny Baker and Leacock and um, Robert Drew and Al Mazels, what they, you know, I mean, they were just, they're really the visionaries. I mean, as soon as you could get cameras off of tripods and make them lightweight and you could, you know, they were like, this is, this is where it's at, you know, like we can move around and follow people. And, you know, their, their amazing film Primary follows the, you know, the primary race of um, um, JFK running for office before he's president. I mean, it's brilliant. I mean, it's, he, they, they do everything, you know, they just, you know, I'm just kind of, I'm really standing on their shoulders, like in terms of what they discovered of like just being there when things are happening. Um, and uh, so I love that work. Um, uh, I love, yeah, there's a lot of, like I, li I also like a lot of fiction stuff. I mean, um, like uh, Alexander Kluge is interesting, a German filmmaker, very sort of also kind of built, uh, influenced by the Frankfurt School. Um, I love Fassbender, you know, but I'll, those, you know, I like drama and, 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 and I mean, it was actually um, Frederick Weissman, like that was the first Verite film that I saw when I was studying filmmaking where I was like, wow, okay, this is incredible. And it's, it's um, shot in a um, institution for the criminally insane and was so controversial when it was released that it was banned for I think 30 years. Mm -hmm. Like once it, it was like premiered in New York and then they were like, this is, you know, we need to, we need to make this film go away. And it, you couldn't see it um, for, for decades. Hi. Um, I feel like one of the things that happens as you watch all of these films is you really start to see the emergence of the character of you. And I was wondering if that is intentional and if, like, what sort of your relationship will be with having yourself in the stories going forward. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, that, that you're, I think you're right that, that it sort of does chart that. Um, and I, I would say, no, it's not intentional. I mean, 
I, I mean, but it, in each film, they're different. It's differently positioned. Like when I made the film in Iraq, I was really like dead set against not making it about me. Like it was like I did not want it to be like draw attention to, you know, the the perils of the of the American journalist in a conflict zone. I mean, that that narrative is being told. Like I don't, you know, the standing in front of, you know, here I am, like reporting in a dangerous place, kind of stuff. Um, I'm I'm really not interested in that. And like and so I really wanted to, you know, make it so that you're, so that all the empathy is going towards um, the. Uh, the, p the people you see on the screen, but I, I think I'm. Oh, I, I believe that I'm. Oh, that that there is this constant presence. I mean, that I'm framing and I'm holding the camera and I'm making choices, and that you you you're aware of that, even though you know I'm not in a sense named or explicitly a character. Um, and then we had a very interesting experience with um, with the oath. I was editing it with an amazing editor Jonathan Oppenheim. Oppenheimer and um, he, we were doing we were doing rough cut screenings before we'd locked the picture, and he had he he realized that there was a kind of uneasiness in in among audiences, which is like they were like, what the fuck is happening here, and why do they have all this access, and that that we realized that there was a kind of distraction because it was so some of the situations were pretty um, explosive, and and then he realized that we kind of had to break the fourth wall, like in order to like let the narrative work you know like we sort of had to say hey we're here the camera's here um and just so you know he knows the camera's here and we're all in on it and then and then keep going and that and that was like a really important thing that we discovered when we were editing even though it wasn't how we'd built the story i mean i have a tendency or, or an inclination to like to build um like scene based arcs so that's like you have scenes that build on scenes and they they take you someplace and and that is like to me. I really like that you know the sort of drama that you can do with that, and and how you can sort of pull the audience in, um, and that when you draw too much attention to yourself, then you know it becomes maybe a bit more of an essay, and it sort of you, you sort of get you drop out of that. And um, so so my inclination t tends to be to not want to sort of draw attention to the camera. Um, uh, but so with the middle film, we did we chose to sort of insert the camera in it, and 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 then obviously things were totally. You know, it was a totally different ball game with with Citizen Four because I was clearly a participant, and so uh, it was. You know, that this is a film that's told. You know, with with I, and it begins with you know my sort of experience, and that I'm. You know, I feel like in this film, I'm. I'm I, I narrate the, the, you know, the film, and 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 it was it was a complicated. You know. Um, balance of how to do it because I didn't want it to, to tip into becoming an essay or a personal essay um, and I wanted to get that kind of you know really um, like there's a certain kind of like substance to what I think you can do with verte scenes and and you know so you have Glenn at the beginning Glenn is um, you meet Glenn and there are all these dogs he's on his porch and he gets a phone call and he's like doing an interview and you just know everything you need to know about Glenn Greenwald in two minutes you know <laughs> and and I just I mean I'm I'm really really love that and and I and I want to be able to deliver that and if I'm sort of like in the film too much I just I think it's it to me it's like how to find that balance and so you're right that like in this in the last film I've kind of been pulled into the narrative and. It's um, uh, the journalist um, James Risen just did a wrote a book called um, I think Pay Any Price is that it about the sort of cost mm. of the war on terror and 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 if people know James Risen's story he's um, renowned um, New York Times journalist Pulitzer Prize winning who the uh, Obama administration first the Bush administration then the Obama administration were trying to compel him to testify against his source and they came after him for years to try to you know to 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 go and and testify. And he and he refused to do it. And he writes in his book that that at some point, you know, his his documenting or his reporting on the war on terror, um, then he became sort of folded into it, you know, because he was doing this reporting, and then the government came after him. And and so there's this. I feel a similar kind of thing, like by by, by documenting this history, then I kind of got. Um, so, sort of sucked into it by being put on a watch list. So like I then become pulled into the narrative that I sort of entered into from the outside. Uh, good evening and, and thank you so much for your, your work. I just have, I guess, um, my first question when looking at Citizen Four and um, 
it being um, covering obviously a, a topic that's so fresh in our minds and you know on our lips, um, and really wanting to challenge this notion of a passive audience. What, in your opinion, in sort of your vision, would you want to see an audience member walking away with and stepping into, I guess, if you will? And if I may ask a second question, if you feel, if you feel so inspired, um, what do you think has provided you, um, Laura, uh, access, so much, I think, wonderful access to sources and individuals, uh, charisma, persistence? Um, I don't know. I don't know. If that makes sense. Um, I mean, the first question I'm going to just, I'm going to pass on it because I'm not, I mean, it's not about trying to get you, like, it's to, like, to have an, a particular action. I mean, I can tell you, like, what I find moving. I find, like, the, what I, the hope in the film is, you know, people, people willing to take personal risk because they see something that's wrong and, and willing to sort of step up. And it's, it's Snowden, it's not only Snowden, it's, it's, you know, Glenn in the film, Lily and Benny, and that, that, that actually I find just, like, something that we can, you know, learn from. So, but I don't want to talk about, like, because I don't make the films because I want certain actions to happen. Um, but in, in terms of like the access, I mean, I think probably it's a combination of I, I'm really, I, I mean, I'm patient. I think that that, um, and I'm able to deal with a certain amount of uncertainty um, and that that kind of works in my favor. Um, and, or, or I even, you know, I, I like sort of trying to find the story or feel the story coming. Um, and, uh, and I think, yeah, and, and that I'm, I try to get to places before they become news, you know what I mean? Like, I knew that um, the elections in Iraq would be, you know, would be all over the news, but I was there months ahead of time when it was sort of, when, you know, when the UN, you know, were two people who were meeting with the military, and I was like, that's really interesting. Like, I can get there then, you know, that's not when the news, so like, by not sort of following the pack, trying to like not follow the pack. And I think, you know, the pack is not, like I've seen it, like I've, and I've been in it. It's not a very, um, you know, um, attractive, you know, situation. I mean, you have this like, group of people who are all, like, you know, every camera pointing at the exact same thing and, you know, simultaneously and, and basically reporting the same thing. And I was like, okay, what if you don't look at that direction, you look in other directions? And, um, and I think then people are more open to, to you because you're not, um, yeah, you're you're coming at things from a different perspective. Hi, I, I wanted to ask about your uh, collaboration with Trevor Packman because he's on the credits. Uh, and uh, Yay, Trevor. how did that happen? And if there has been other collaborations together or in the future? Uh -huh. Um, I don't know. I maybe Trevor should. <laughs> no, I mean I, I'll, I'll answer it, and um, and then it, when we can give the microphone to Trevor, maybe. Um, it, you know, Trevor's um, uh, the collaboration began by being a viewer of his work. Um, I was um, trying to um, film in Guantanamo, and we were, and I contacted a cinematographer, Kirsten Johnson, who's an amazing collaborator. And I just said, you know, like, uh, uh, would you be willing to go on a shoot to Guantanamo? And you're really not going to have access to anything, but you're going to have to make it have a lot of meaning. <laughs> and she's like, oh, okay. And then immediately she says, do you know Trevor's work? And then, then that's how I um, started um, uh, uh, looking at his stuff. And, um, and she went and, and, and filmed, we talked about that, and then at some point I got up the nerve to send him an email and you know, said that you know, if you were ever in New York, maybe you know, we, could, we could meet for coffee or something. And, um, and so that's how we first met. And then when, I was, when we were editing um, Citizen Four in Berlin, um, uh, Trevor was was in town, and we were talking. Um, I was talking with my, my editor there, Mathilde Bonfa, and, and producer Dirk Valetsky, and we were like, you know, we want to be able to sort of include the architecture of like the surveillance, you know, surveillance state in a lot of in a way like Trevor does with his photography. And how, who could we talk to about doing it? And um, and kind of thinking like, there's no way that he would, you know, that he would consider shooting for us. Um, but it was worth asking, and um, and so I, I asked, and and it was an amazing. I mean, the footage that he shot. I mean, this is like an example of like like painful choices you have to make um, with documentaries where you can't include everything that you love because the footage is, you know, it's incredible, and the places that he went to um, to and and it's 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 an incredible, and I'm super. Um, yeah, it's an amazing collaboration, and 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 all of I mean, it's like 
you know, even though I oftentimes go into the field and, and work and do a lot of shooting alone, I'm always collaborating. Like my editor, this film is, you know, is as much a, about her as it is about me. And, and so that's like one of the really beautiful things, but I don't know if Trevor wants to say anything. <laughs> I mean, we were hanging out in Berlin and like, I don't know, I love you. I think you're the <laughs> raddest person in the universe. Like, I love you, love you. <laughs> and, like, I, did, I remember we were hanging out in Berlin and you're like, hey, do you want to shoot some stuff for me? And my automatic default thing is always like, no, 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 no. <laughs> no, 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 I'm too busy. I don't want to do anything for us. And then I went to sleep that night and I, then I couldn't sleep all night and I had a notebook where I think I had like a hundred ideas <laughs> for things that I woke up in the morning and I was like, Dude, you're fucking crazy. Like, work on Laura's movie. So I think I called you up. I was like, I'm sorry. I said no. Can I like, can I work on your movie? You know, like I, I really want to do this. You know, and then yeah. I just did. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Um, I was just curious if the uh, NSA revelations played out uh, in the public eye the way you might have imagined it when you were first receiving these uh, documents from uh, Edward Snowden. You know, like, I, uh, I mean, I'm going to, I was almost going to say, like, let's not do that question, just because it's a question that I've been getting so often that, and I've been doing, that it's really nice to be among artists and, like, maybe folk focus the questions on more aesthetic questions. And I don't mean to dismiss it. I mean, I think those are, you know, it's, it's a genuine question, but I feel like I've answered it a lot, so maybe I'll take the opportunity not to answer it today. <laughs> so this one's really kind of stupid and specific. But in My Country, My Country, this is something some of my friends and I have talked about quite a bit, actually. There's a moment when uh, the woman is with the fly swatter and they're trying to capture the fly, and there's a sound of bombs exploding as if they're outside. And then it cuts to a shot of the street uh, outside of their apartment, presumably. Also, bombs, the same sort of soundtrack is going on. And I was wondering, even if you, I mean, obviously, if you remember this moment, but which one of those does that belong to? And where does the choice come for you to tonally put one over the other to kind of merge the ideas? <coughs> So, um, so that situation was, yeah, there were, there were bombs going off all day and then she starts swatting flies. So it, it existed in both footage, like when I was filming outside and when I was filming, but in like, we are editing, we're always editing. And so we put those two things together. I mean, but so, so that it's, um, you know, you see the, the reality from inside and the reality from outside, sort of, ju you know, juxtaposed next to each other. So I, I don't, I can't remember which way. I mean, I'm I, like, you know, the, both things happened. Like sh there was explosions going off while she was trying to kill flies, and there were ex explosions going off outside. And I mean, I think in in, so I so I don't, that does that answer you know your question? Like there, they, obviously they didn't happen simultaneously. I was because I was you know the only camera person there, but they would happen all on the same day. It was actually, I say, there's actually a story about that. I, when I showed the film, I sent the film to Dr. Riyadh to look at it before. I mean, I always send my, I always show the films before I, I finish them to the people who are in them. Um, you know, they take such huge risk. And so I showed it to him and he was like, you know, I have one note for you, Laura. There's just, you know, one thing I have to say about the film. And I got really nervous. And he said, he's just like, why are you spending so much time with my sister-in-law trying to kill a fly when people are, you know, suffering in Iraq? And, you know, like, and I was like, and he didn't understand understand like how it how much it conveyed metaphorically um, and I had to say no no like this is it's a really important scene and this is why it's like like the fact that you know that that bombs have become so mundane that you're you know you, that you forget about them uh, do you have any idea why Yemen is such a hot spot Uh, can we can we like make can we do art questions? <laughs> and I'm not I don't want to. I do, <laughs> but I think I'm good. I mean, I I I just I'm, I I'm always getting asked those kinds of questions. So. <laughs> Is there any other questions? I'm looking for hands. There's one for here. Mm -hmm.
Okay, I'll ask a really uh, like a, a real art question. You keep talking about uh, resisting the impulse towards the essay film, mm -hmm. and um, in the context of documentary practices in the art world right now, um, we might even say there's a lot of essay film <laughs> um, in installation and, and museum um, work. So I just want to give you an opportunity to talk about that, and if you think that you might start making essay film. <laughs> in the context I mean, of like, like, I mean, so I'm not. Uh, I don't. I'm not. I don't have like a ban against essay films. I mean, I I think there are people who do it masterfully. I mean, you have people like Chris Marker, you know. And but I think it takes a certain skill set, and like that, you you know. And I think that as as artists or filmmakers, we all have like particular voices um, that you know that we can be most expressive using. And so it's it's just like it doesn't. I don't. I'm not drawn to it. Um, it Partly because it's probably um, very much um, language-based and verbal, and um, I think I like to work with images, and so that's probably one of the reasons why I probably won't be doing um, that type of work because I st I'm really interested in sort of getting at meaning through through other ways that uh, that are not about language. So I think we have time for one last question. Yes. Hello. Um, I guess it's kind of an art question. There's something, you know, many of us are artists here, <laughs> making our work in the context of the art market. Mm -hmm. And there's something, I mean, it's almost, it, it's not funny at all, but in a way, it's something so ironic about, on the one hand, because you're making the work that you want to make, you're forced to leave this country and live abroad. And then now you're being nominated for an Academy Award. I mean, <laughs> How, what would you say to artists about like, how, how do you make sense of that and does that, does that give you validation in some way or does, that, or does that somehow allow you to do more in the future or does it, or does it actually prohibit you in a way? I mean, it's a definitely kind of a bit schizophrenic, you know, like thinking, you know, w w w I mean, there were a lot of like, uh, meetings about worst case scenario situations, you know, and there weren't that many me many meetings about best case scenario situations, <laughs> and and so like being nominated would, would would sort of be in the other category in the best case scenario. No, I mean we had meetings about like okay, so the UK government, you know, if they use the terrorism act to try to extradite me from Berlin, you know, I mean those were the kinds of meetings we were having, and um, and so to release the film and have it received positively, you know, is it is, it means a lot, it means a lot. And, um, but it's also a bit of a schizophrenic reality because, you know, there are a lot of people who are in the film who won't be able to, to be there, you know? And um, so um, Edward Snowden won't be able to be there. Jacob Applebaum doesn't feel safe to come to the United States. Um, and I've been, you know, w working with him for years documenting. Um, and there are a lot of people who can't travel here. And so those realities are still very present, you know, e and those risks and dangers, and there are still dangers to sources who the government is coming after, journalists that the government is coming after, and maybe I'm a little bit less um, at risk right now, but that doesn't mean that, you know, there aren't lots of other people who are at risk. And so it's kind of in that it's sort of a bittersweet thing because it's not like, um, oh, you know, the surveillance state has been, you know, undone or that, you know, the government's not coming after sources and whistleblowers anymore. They certainly are. And so it's kind of, it's, it's a bit of a bittersweet thing because it's, of course, wonderful that the issues get out and they get recognized. Um, but you know, th there's some, you know, there's, we're, we have, you know, there are drones flying over countries killing people based on metadata right now, today. <laughs> I mean, right now, as we're sitting here. And, um, and that's, you know, that's a kind of crazy reality that we're living in. And so, um, it's, it is, you know, I, I mean, I, but I do think that the fact that, that there, there has been the sort of, like, it, that the film has kind of hit a nerve into a space and sort of maybe, you know, um, maybe opened up a place where people can think about what, what does dissent look like um, in these times, um, you know, means a lot. And it's, it's, it's yeah, so, and, and, and hopefully it, it, you know, that the, the recognition will, could, you know, more people will, will get to, to see that or experience it. Okay, so thank you so much to Laura and Bettina, fantastic.